Uh, good morning. My name is Joel Thomas. I'm the lead pastor. Thank you to all of you joining us online. So glad to have you with us. Let us know city, town, state you're joining us from. Want to celebrate that. And again, if this is your first Sunday, first Sunday-ish, boy, I just want to say welcome home. We're glad that you're here. There's a lot of other places you could be, right? You could be warm in your beds, but no, you're here and you're here not by accident. Today, I'm excited. We're kicking off a new series called Refocused. And yes, I will get to the whiteboard, but don't worry. I won't be writing any words because I have the worst handwriting in the world. It's stick figures. I feel like I can pull it off. So hang with me. You can give reviews later, but we're, we're going to try because I'm a very visual guy. But again, we're kicking off this series called Refocused. See if you don't feel like I do. February into Valentine's Day, right? It feels like a manufactured, organized assault against romantic relationships. Amen? Right? That's just what it feels like. If you are with someone, right? You're in the, evidently, the, the, the positive category. Right? You're with someone. And so it, it becomes pretty good. Although the risk reward of making sure you plan the right Valentine's night, day out can be high. Right? So I'm just cautioning you, right? Be careful, fellas, wives, you know, and significant others. Figure this out, right? It's important. And then, right, if you're single, as my wife would have told you, again, uh, she was 33 when we got married. And this particular time of year, this, even this entire month, she would refer to it as loathsome. Any amens there? Right? Just, just loathsome. It's like, why does there need to be one time a year that just highlights that evidently, right, I'm less than, that I'm not, I don't have that person, that significant other. And I'm sure all of us have felt it. I felt it when I was single. Here's the deal. Run, you're not less than. You're, you're not, right? You're, you're dating, marital, whatever, whatever status that is, that doesn't make you more than or less than. What I do appreciate about February, though, what I do appreciate about this time, even though it's horribly commercialized and all that, is it is kind of this annual time of year to refocus on the importance, the value, the foundational principles of relationships. Now, this is not rocket science. It's not going to blow your mind, right? But all of us were, in fact, created for relationships. And it's not just romantic, and we know that, but sometimes we need to be reminded of it. Again, the rest of the world says you're only created for romantic relationships, and if you don't have them, you're less than. Again, that's false. You're created for relationships, period. Again, not just romantic, right? Platonic, family relationships. You're created for those. You're created for deep friendships, right? All of those relationships, you are created for them. It's actually baked into our DNA, into our very code. Genesis 1, says this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created, right? You and I, it's this big churchy phrase called image bears. You and I have been created in the image of God. Now, there's a lot of things that can be said and so much depths and layers that we could get into about this idea of being an image bearer of God. But one of the things, foundational, that this triune God that we serve, right? This God that expresses himself in three different personalities, God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, right? Father, Spirit, and Son, is that they are one. They are united in perfect relationship. As mysterious as the Trinity is, that is one of the things we know to be true. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have this incredible oneness and united relationship. We are to thou then reflect that kind of oneness, that harmony of relationship back to the world around us. But unfortunately, sin enters in. And along with sin comes our own pride, comes selfishness, greed, which then begins to express itself through our insecurities, right, and confusion that leaves a mess of our relationships. So rather than focusing on, the, focusing on the healthy thing that God has called us to, no, we get drawn to the mess. Right along the way, we get distracted by fads and trends and cultural pressures that push us away from God's ideal and toward embracing instead of his vision for healthy relationships, we actually embrace dysfunctional relationships. I gotta tell you, man, we must refocus ourselves towards God's vision for healthy relationships. We must refocus ourselves towards God's vision of healthy relationships. I can tell you this, for more than, uh, better than the first half of my life, I got relationships wrong. I bet we could all kind of raise our hands. 
right? And it begins at a very young age. And these are all good things. I don't mean to make this right horrible. You start at a young age and you, you look at your parents, you look at your siblings, and that's where you find identity. That's where you begin to learn about relationships, the health or not thereof. That's pretty good if you grow up in a really healthy, right, honest, good, kind, loving family. But a lot of us, right, we grew up in dysfunctional places. And even the best healthy family still has dysfunctional layers. And so we grow up, right, we, we look for them for identity. We look for others to tell us what healthy relationships look like. Meaning even our parents, our siblings, they're not perfect, and we realize that what we're focusing on there is less than God's best. You get older, right? You become that young teenager and now you're looking for friends. I spent like 15 years doing youth ministry. I loved it. My wife and I still, man, we love, teenagers love, man, the, the teenage ministry, all of that. But they're right there, they're kind of, they're, they're pairing up, they're forming tribes, right? Your friends form the focus of your, they become your end all be all. And it's kind of like the blind leading the blind. And all of a sudden your friends who are still just figuring stuff out, they're forming your vision for healthy relationships. And therefore it's not always awesome. We get distracted, right? And then you, you begin, right? Your attraction, the opposite sex and out dating and sex and all that becomes, begins to come into play. You know, for me, but I entered into that season where it was women, women, it was my dating status. All of that became what I focused on, what she liked, what she wanted, what they wanted to do. Again, to get distracted and you lose focus on what God wants for you. And we must refocus our vision on God's model for healthy relationships. We have to do this because relationships are key to everything we do. And if we get them wrong, everything else spools out. We must refocus our vision on God's model for healthy relationships. I tell you, there's a lot of places we could go in scripture that gives us that model. I can't think of any better than 1 Corinthians 13, four through seven. You've all heard it. You go, I, I don't really read the Bible. You've been to a wedding, right? I guarantee you, you've been to a wedding and I, I would be stunned. My guess is all of us have heard this. This is the love chapter. It's right, it's what is spoken at, at wedding upon wedding upon wedding. But I gotta tell you, this forms the foundation. I can't think of a better passage that condenses it down and says, do this, not this. And makes it very simple and very straightforward for all of us. And so what we're gonna do during this entire series for the next several weeks, we're gonna peel this apart. We're gonna dig in because it's so clear, it's so concise, and this is the framework, this is the roadmap for us for healthy relationships. If you got your Bibles, if you wanna look on the screen, it's this, right? 1 Corinthians 13. Four through seven, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Right, we read that, you go to a wedding and you're like, oh, that's so sweet. And then we walk away and most of us don't use that as a mirror for our own relationships. We go, oh, that's so sweet. And then we move on with our lives. We gotta understand some of the context here because we're beginning this understanding, right? If Paul, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? God using Paul as his writing instrument gives us this foundation. Here's what we should focus on for healthy relationships. But what we don't understand is one, we're, we got a couple things tying our hands behind our back. One, we're not in the culture that Paul was in, right? Paul is writing this letter. He sends it to these home churches in the city of Corinth. Corinth is this huge metropolitan city, all sorts of influences, different religions, different practices, different ideas, all of that kind of stuff. And then within the church, in the city of Corinth are these small little home churches, doing their best to cling to the truth of Christ in their life. And so he writes this letter and he sends it to them. And what would happen is they'd receive the letter and then it would go into one house and they would get up and they would read it. And then it would move on, go to another home church. And this is kind of how it worked in the early church, right? There weren't these big churches they met, they were just homes. And Paul writes this letter. But again, we're, we're starting a little bit handicapped because we don't understand the culture and we don't really understand the language. If we're gonna know all that Paul has for us to understand, all the Holy Spirit wants us to grasp this vision of healthy, of healthy relationships, we've gotta understand both. Because the English is general, 
But Paul is incredibly specific. And when we don't understand the definition of a thing, we're going to make it say something that it's not intended to. And that applies specifically to our understanding of love and relationships. When we don't know what love is, we force it to be what it's not. When we don't know what love is, we force it to be what it's not. And so what we got to understand right out of the gate, right? We read it and it says, love is patient, love is kind. What you have to understand, and again, I, bear with me here because this is important. We're going to miss stuff if we don't get this right out of the gate. Paul is being very specific for every one of us. He doesn't say love is patient. That's not the word he uses. Because in the Greek language, they had four words for love. So if you're that person sitting in that house church, immediately, even by his word choice, he tells you specifically what love is to look like. And we're gonna miss that if we don't. So we're gonna spend a little time and we're gonna look at these kind of these four words for love and then we're gonna land and understand where Paul directs us by the Holy Spirit to understand. First one is this, right? There's these four words. So you've got eros, storge, philia, and agape. First one, eros. Right? And this is where I'm gonna draw. Hang with me. Online, hopefully you can see this. We tried. Right, the idea Paul is gonna lay this case out. He's gonna say, there are these four loves. Only one of them is strong enough and appropriate enough, right, and powerful enough to form the trunk of a tree that all others, that all other loves can then flow out of. Only one of them. If you're sitting in that room, you're reading this letter, the, the most common, one of the most common loves is this idea of eros. Eros was one word for love. Now it described as we might understand, right, this is the word that we get for erotic love. It does often refer to sexual love, but that's not just it. It's the goosebump inducing, breathtaking, awe-inspiring emotional reaction to an experience or an event that overwhelms your senses. That's Eros. So yes, it relates to sex in the moment, right? The, the heights of sexual ecstasy, sure, but it's bigger than that. So much of life was, in the Greeks, in that, in that culture, directed toward pursuing Eros kind of love, the feel-good love, right? It'd be for the sports fan, right? It's watching the play that seals the deal and wins the game, and the entire crowd, right, leaps to their feet and spontaneously cheers. That's Eros, right? Pursuing that kind of feeling, right? For the nature lover, it's being stopped in your tracks on that trail, when you see that, that expanse, that beauty, that you literally, you just can't go on any further. You have to stop and just go, oh man, that's incredible. Last August, I was out camping outside Telluride. It's my favorite part of Colorado. And I, and I hiked up to, uh, to Bridal Veil Falls there at the end of the Box Canyon. And literally, I mean, I had to sit down because it was like those weak in the knees moments. For me, man, nature is the biggest and best cathedral ever. And I just had to sit there and was in awe and just right chills of this incredible waterfall. That's Eros, right? For the audiophile, those of us that just love music, it's the heights of emotion felt as an orchestra plays Beethoven's fifth, right? Eros is the emotional high and the rush in the moment of ecstasy. It's not a bad love. Don't hear me that. It's not a bad love. Right, the truth is God created each one of these. None of these are inherently bad. It's powerful, it's potent, it's pleasing to every one of us and it's worthy of incredible things. But here's the problem. It's not meant to be foundational. It is by nature momentary and fleeting. Here's the big idea to understand. When you base relationships around eros, around that fleeting momentary rush of emotions, right? Relationships built on eros, they will burn out and break from chasing unrealistic emotional highs. Any, I, I, again, I, I hesitate to do this, but I, am, I was guilty of this for years, right? Pursuing eros because we love the feel of that, right? The dopamine, endorphin rush of that feeling. I'm just, and that's what we're gonna to try to base our entire relationships on. No, not every day can be incredible. Not every experience can be the best. If you ever watched Friends, the, the, the TV show Friends, there's an episode with Alec Baldwin when he's like the most positive person in the world. They're like, not every cab ride is that incredible. Right, it's that person that just wants every experience to be a mountaintop. And this is a danger, right? We end up chasing 
physical responses, again, dopamine, endorphin rushes, it's only gonna end in distraction because it's never meant to build everything else. I'm sorry, Eros is great, but it can't support the weight of the other loves. So much so. Scripture is very clear, telling us to avoid this as our foundation. The Apostle Paul writes again, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. He says, run from sexual sin, partly because this will not support your life. It won't. What'll happen is when the storms come, the winds blow, it will break your life apart when you try to make eros the foundation of all your loves. Okay, so, right, you're sitting in that room, that, that home church in Corinth. Again, you know this, right? You're sitting there as a Greek, you're reading this, okay, so it's not eros. Well, then, well, then what is it? It must be, right, here's the other one, storge. We're gonna use blue, Clearly, storge, this is a great love. Storge's gotta be the one that's strong enough, right? This, this forms the trunk that all these other loves, they can flow out of. It, it must be storge, storge then. It refers to family love, right? The covenant of love between a parent and a child and between family members in general. That's gotta be great, right? It's gotta be storge. Everything has to flow out of that. Everything flows out of family, right? Now, this is good unless... Storge becomes your focus and unless it becomes your world and unless it becomes the thing supporting everything else in your life. Because as good as storge is, the negative impacts of storge, they result in becoming codependent relationships. Right, it's, it's that family, right? It's that, that parent that so identifies with the child that just won't let them go, that imbues all of their meaning in that child and can never let them go. And all of a sudden there's an unhealthy codependency. As good as Storge is, as good as it is to have a relationship with your family, it's not intended to form the trunk, the support system. Right, it just isn't. Right, it's that mom or that dad that just babies the child all the way into adulthood into their 20s, extending adolescence, 20s, 30s, 40s, living forever in the basement. No, it's not healthy. Storge, when it goes sideways, actually it ends up in the empty nester syndrome. The reason we have empty nester syndrome, I'll tell you, is because you've got parents that have put everything into kids and forgot to put everything into each other and into God. And so all of a sudden that child is pulled out of the relationship and they don't know what to do. Storge is not strong enough. Storge causes pain in the parent and the child when it becomes your entire world. Causes pain in the parent and the child when it becomes your entire world. And even scripture kind of alludes to this idea that it's not healthy to allow storge to form the trunk, the foundation of your relationships. Colossians 3.21, fathers, which you could insert just parents, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Do not provoke them. That word provoke in the original Greek language, it means to irritate, to arouse feelings such as anger, hurt, shame, and fear to the point of exasperation. This is what happens, right, with parents. I'm gonna just talk to parents right now. You will exasperate your children when you look to them for your entire meaning. That becomes a jail cell and a trap for your kids. And it's how storge goes sideways. It leads to bitterness in them. Now relationships built on storge, they're gonna break just like Eros did. And they more often than not result in unhealthy codependency between both. And so again, right, you're sitting in this room, you're in Corinth, you're reading this letter, you're like, okay, so it's not Eros, it's not Storge, right? What else could it be? And you go, well, clearly it's the one, it's the one word, the one idea of love that the Greeks said was the highest of loves that man could ever seek to attain. And that's philia. Philia is the third word for love. It's the word, right? We get the, we get the word Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, right? It's deep friendship and affection, partnership. Again, the, the Greeks believed this was the height outside of religious experience, right? This is what man could do, right? And clearly, man, philia has got to be the love that supports all others. We, we see philia in scripture. If you know the story, King David, right? King David in Israel, he had a friend, Jonathan. 
And they were deep, deep friends. They swore friendship to one another, swore their lives to one another because they loved each other as themselves. You go, well, God, clearly it's that love. That must form the trunk. That must be strong enough, right? This brotherly affection of of seeing that friend as as almost like family member and, and just giving your life for them. That's awesome, it is. But here's the problem. It tells us who our friends are and how to love them. It doesn't tell us what to do with people who look, act, think, and are different than us. No, philia cannot bear the weight of our relationships because it eventually excludes others. I will do this for my friends. But what about everybody else? What about those who aren't like me? Philia gets sideways. It can't bear the weight of the kind of love God has called us to. It becomes exclusionary. It becomes a way of identifying who's in, who's out. It says, I'll love all. Only my friends, but not others. And so this love, when it gets twisted with sin that all of us have, becomes tribal. And eventually this love, that is a great love and a powerful love, it becomes a way of identifying who is an outsider. So again, not philia. So those sitting in that room reading this letter from the Apostle Paul, they know this. These are very common words they would have experienced in their life. And so Paul doesn't use any of them. He doesn't say philia is patient and kind. He doesn't say storge is patient and kind. He doesn't say eros is patient and kind. He uses one word. He says this word above all others can support and grow all the others. And it's agape. Agape is this fourth word for love. It speaks of the most powerful, the noblest type of love, a sacrificial love. Agape is more than a feeling. The others have to do with feelings. This one is about a choice and a commitment of the will in spite of the actions of the other person. This is the love that God has for you, that he has for me. This is the kind of love that sends Jesus to the cross willingly to give his life, to pay the price for you, for me, to sacrifice himself is agape. And only agape that Jesus himself personifies, right? And we as followers of Jesus, we're to love one another with this kind of sacrificial, this letting go of what we think we deserve kind of love. It's that kind of love that Jesus personifies and it's that kind of love that Jesus uses in his great parable, the Good Samaritan, when he's describing how we should love others. I'm I'm sure many of us, right, we're familiar with the Good Samaritan, this man who is ethnically, culturally different. He was an enemy of Jews. He comes upon a Jew, his enemy, who's been brutalized, beaten up, and left for dead. This man, agape, loves him. How do we know it? Because he sacrifices his time. He sacrifices his resources. He gives everything without needing anything in return to care for this Jewish man who at the time would have been his enemy and in so doing demonstrates agape love. Agape love is a strong foundation all other loves now can grow out of. Right, it's agape love that is strong enough to take all the emotional highs of Eros and you go, nah, it can find its support out of agape, right? That's, that's agape love. It's agape love that roots in humble confidence, offering protection from those who are lean towards any sort of codependency. No, it's only agape love that can give you the strength to get beyond that. And it's agape love that elevates our, our hearts and our minds beyond even the greatest heights of humanistic intentions and can support even philia love. Only agape love. And you go, it's just those words, right? And how much we miss in understanding the Apostle Paul because we don't understand the language and we don't understand the culture. He doesn't just say love is patient and love is kind. No, Paul says agape is patient. Agape is kind. Agape love provides the strong center 
the other loves can be rooted and nourished from. That's what we have to get to. This self-sacrificing agape love. And now, now that we understand, right? Now that you understand, we've clarified the terms. Now we get into the specific depiction, a way of knowing if I'm living in the support system of agape love versus this. Love is what? Patient, right? He gets specific. Now we know what love he's talking about. Now he goes one layer deeper. You wanna go, hey, I need to know, hey, Paul, how do I know if this is the vision for relationships, if this is the foundation that God has for me in my relationships, how will I know if I'm living in it? First identifier is that it will be patient. Again, patient is, is kind of a lame translation really for the Greek word. It really means long suffering. You wanna know if you're demonstrating agape love to others? Are you long suffering? It's the way Jesus responds tough, right? He's not, he's not quick, he's not forced, he's not rushed, he's patient, hoping that none of us would perish. It means that we're gonna persevere patiently, bravely, we're going to endure misfortunes and troubles. We're going to be patient in bearing others' offenses and their injuries against us. It means we're going to be mild. We're going to be slow in responding, slow to anger, slow to react. To be patient is to say that we're going to exhibit internal and external control, even during difficult and personally painful experiences. It's the idea of this ancient priest, uh, preacher, John Chrysostom. He says, this is the value of the man who has been horribly wronged, horribly hurt, unjustly so, and has every right to lash out, but instead chooses patience, mercy, and grace. Agape love is first and foremost patience. I ask you, do you avenge yourself as soon as you have the opportunity to those that have hurt you? Me? More times than I like to admit. This becomes a mirror for healthy relationships for all of us. Am I patient, particularly with the person that hurts me? And then he goes one layer deeper. He says, agape love is kind. Ooh, it's kind. When we show God's love, it will be seen in simple acts of kindness. It's mild. It's pleasant. It's virtuous and good. Paul says that this simple idea of kindness actually forms the foundation of what he calls the, the fruits of the Spirit. Kind and how it responds to hurts and to hangups. Kind and demonstrating right affection, support, and belief in others. This is, I believe, the simplest of instructions, but possibly this one alone might be the hardest to apply. Right? When you are hurt, when you're wounded, when you're frustrated, I gotta tell you, if you're anything like me, and maybe it's just, right, me, just being cathartic on my own. I'm guessing not. The last thing I want to be is kind. But that's agape. That's the love God's called me to. It means I'm not going to be self-centered. I'm not going to be me first. No, I'm going to choose to respond in kindness. Mm. And demonstrating affection, support, and my belief in others, I'm not going to defend. I'm not going to lash out. I'm not going to put down. I'm not going to put them in their place. No, I'm going to choose to love with kindness. So I'm going to invite the band to come back up. We're going to wrap up here this morning for all of us. I got, I got a couple questions I want to ask you. What does long suffering and patience look like in your relationships? Again, you don't have to speak it out loud. If you're sitting next to a significant other here in the room, that means don't elbow them, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean look at them and point the finger, right? Don't do that. Nope, keep your hands down, your elbows in, hide and tight, right? Do that. But just honestly, right? This is, this is the mirror. This is the goal. 
This is what God's called us to, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Agape love is. It's not arrows. It's not the highs of emotion. It's not allowing all of that to draw you. Nope, you can't base it on that. It's not your family relationships. Nope, they're not strong enough either. It's not even your, your brotherhood, your friendships, all that. No, it's something deeper, greater. It's agape. It's self-sacrificing. It's seeing the needs of others as above yourselves and responding in patience and kindness. What's that look like in your relationships? Would those who know you best describe you as patient and kind? <laughs> Be honest. And if they don't, man, to get before the Lord, say, okay, God, can you grow this in me? Can you grow agape in me? Can you help me choose that? How can you demonstrate agape kindness in your relationships this week? Because love that lasts, that weathers storms and bears the weight of all other love has agape at its center. I'm gonna invite you to stand because we're, we're also this morning, we're gonna go at a time of taking communion. I can't think of a better morning to take communion than on a morning we remind ourselves of the sa- self-sacrificial love of agape that Christ himself personified and demonstrated for every one of us, right? If you, if you don't have that experience with communion, right? Th- this is what Christ has, has called us to do in remembrance of him living out agape for each and every one of us, right? The, the, the cracker there representing his life broken, his body broken for us as he demonstrates this kind of love sacrifice himself. His blood, the juice shed on our behalf, to forgive us, to cleanse us for all who would put their faith and trust in him who would now take his example and make agape their center. Communion is for all of us that have made that decision. And so we're gonna gonna go to a time of worship. Band's gonna lead us. I invite you to just spread around if you wanna do that. Take it as a family. Take it individually. Take it on your own terms and your own time but allow Christ's sacrifice to reflect back on you and the love that you show others. Is it strong enough for all other loves to grow out of? If not, there's some work that he needs to do. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, your example, your power in our lives. Mm. We praise you and thank you that you love us that you are for us, that you model this to us, that you have given all of yourself for all of us. Would we turn around and do the same? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.